Welcome back to Worth the Effort Woodworking and part two in our Build a Simple Toolbox class, which is the fourth class in our Start Woodworking series. Now, if you haven't seen the first part in it, it's about hour long. Parts two and three are each about 20 to 30 minutes long. It's going to become a recurring theme, I think, that when I get into the editing booth, uh, I find that there's just too much information, so I need to start breaking stuff up a little bit better, become a little bit more organized in my lesson plans. I just thought I could do a little bit more efficiently than I actually could. Well, in part one, we talked about the overall design, the purpose of the toolbox. We talked about the dimensions of the material. We talked about having a reference point in a project and then we did all the joinery of the carcass of this thing. And at that point we broke because we're about to enter into using the second major tool in our holy trinity of hand tools. The chisel, the saws, and the planes. Right now we're about to venture into using hand planes. So that's where we're picking up in this sec part two of that video. Is we have just finished up doing all the joinery of the carcass. And we're now start going to start doing the make pretty using a hand plane. Now, so far, we have played with two of the three holy trinity of woodworking tools. The saw and the chisel. Now it's time to play around with that hand plane. This will be the last time you get to do any kind of finish work on the interior unless you want to hand sand it. And I hate sanding with a passion. So I put some pencil marks on the inside to tell me which side of the board I want to make ready or make pretty. And the outside we will do after it's all glued up. So let me show you how to use that hand plane to make it a little bit better looking. Now, if our idea was to make this, board, this interior section perfectly flat, yeah, it would make sense to use a nice long plane. The example we would be using in this series is the number five. But that's not our goal here. We just want to make it look good. In that case, it's the smaller planes, like the smoothing planes and stuff like that, that make a lot more sense. And we will be using our block plane as a smoother. You just set it really, really, really fine. So it's taking the ever so slightest of shavings with a really tight mouth, put it against a planing stop, make sure that your grain is going in the right direction, and then just take off all the pencil marks. Now that the idea is to start on one side of the board and work your way across. Because if you're taking an even shaving, a lot of times people get track marks and that kind of frustrates them. So I have the ever so slightest of camber on my blade. Blade. I talked about that, so it kind of feathers out on either side. But if you start at one side and move your way over, it's taking an equal amount over here. So if the blade overhangs a little bit on this side, well that side is just doing air because this is the side that's resting against and that's what it's cutting. So you start out just working your way across, taking nice, smooth, long shavings. And don't worry about it. It's only woodworking. One time all the way across, and I'm kind of happy with the result. We we'll call that good enough. Now today I'm going to be using hide glue. It's a very traditional glue, especially in furniture making. And some of the benefits of it is it doesn't really absorb into the wood, so it doesn't make wood fibers swell. So if your joint is a little bit too tight, you know, you put normal glue on it, that fibers swell up and it becomes even tighter. This actually acts somewhat like a lubricant. Also. If your joint is a little bit loose, I mean not, lo not a lot loose, maybe a half a saw curve or something like that, this has some gap filling properties. It is more of a solid, and yes it can be reversed, but that's irrelevant for our situation because we're going to get it right on the first time. But in order to get the gap filling properties, you have to kind of make it a little bit sloppy. So it makes sense, since we have just finished making these interior bits so pretty, to actually protect them from a little bit of that squeeze out. So when I'm doing hide glue and I've already finished the interior, I kind of like putting on some blue tape right along that line. 
That way, if any squeeze out comes out of the joints, it's going to come out on the blue tape and we can just peel it off at a later date. Now, I'm one that likes to use, have a flat workbench. I know a lot of people don't think that's that critical. Within a certain amount, I like mine to be pretty flat because whenever I do glue-ups, especially on boxes like this, I, want, I like using this as a reference to kind of force a box to be flat. Because sometimes, a lot of times, it'll twist on you and it'll rock as the glue is drying. So, because of that, I'm going to be pressing it against the bench. So, just to protect it a little bit, some construction paper will make your life a lot easier. Come time to clean up all that glue speed squeeze out. So, assemble whatever clamps you need and glue spreader. I kind of like using these little paint sticks. I would not use one of those nylon kind of, what are they, those little fingery kind of brushes they have out there with hide glue. It's a lot more difficult to clean those things out compared to PVA, which you can kind of pull out and it looks kind of cool. Just stick with something like a stick or a, or, you know, another common thing I will use is two uh, chopsticks. And then it's just a matter of finding your numbers lining everything up and having at it you got about five minutes to glue it all up so don't stress about it it's one nice thing about high glue is it doesn't dry uber fast and what you want to really focus on is the long grain to long grain stuff don't really worry about the end grain too much for the simple reason it doesn't do much work. Though if you have a extremely gappy joint, a little in there to make the squeeze out a little nicer will help you fill out the gaps. Because remember, this is a little bit of a gap filler. And then just squeeze it all together. Well, this one is actually sitting pretty flat right now, but if it wasn't, if it was kind of lopsided, I would actually clamp the corners down to the bench to force it flat. And that way, as the glue dried, it would kind of keep it there. Other than that, grab a couple rulers, and if you, if you use them as a pinch stick, see where they come together to make sure it's square. For example, this distance is longer than that distance, so I need to knock these together a little bit. If I come over to this corner, give it a few whacks, and remeasure. Corner, see that increased that distance about a half inch. Oh, I got lucky. Dead on both directions. So it's now square. So after that, just let it dry overnight. So now let's do the make pretty on the outside of the box. Now, this is a very kind of standard size box we're going to make. Whether it be for like a kitchen drawer or maybe a small wall cabinet or something like that. It's just common in the, in what we make. And it's one reason why we designed our workbenches this way. With some kind of overhang on the ends, a certain width or height or something like that. Because now, the thing is, if we want to work on this surface, we don't want to be working up here. It's kind of tippy and it can also induce some flex. So if we can simply drop it over the side, because our workbench is a little under two feet wide, well, now we have our planing stock that we can easily work all the way around. These shorter sides, like this right here, obviously it's not going to go over. But if you have any other kind of board, I don't know, like one of those 30 inchers, we can now clamp that hanging off the side. And once again, we now have a planing stock we can push up against, and it's not going to be tweaking our box. So. Now, just grab your hand planes, 
Make sure you have the grain going in the right direction and make it pretty. Now, in my example, my fingers are a little bit underneath the board right here. So the only time you have to worry about anything is when you start planting into the fingers. Now, in that case, it's advantageous to put a little bit of a chamfer on your end just to prevent the grain from blowing out as much. You're going to chamfer that corner anyways, just so it's more comfortable, so no big deal. And then, have that making it pretty. Now, I was kind of curious on how long, how much grip this high glue would have on such a gappy joint as this one right here. Remember, I cut it, all of these on both, both boards on the wrong side of the line to get the maximum number of gappage, doing the proper techniques, but not doing it on the right side of the line. I, this is a common error. But this was so gappy that the glue actually broke loose when I was doing the Make Pretty. So, the technique I want to show you that I was going to do after the Make Pretty is something called pegging. See, the weakness of the box joint is there's nothing mechanical here bringing it together. So here's a secret. We know that these, this box joint prevents the boards from moving up and down apart. But what would happen if we could drive one peg in this way, and that would prevent this board from moving that way, and then another peg in coming this way, that would prevent that board from moving that way. So if neither one of these boards can move out like that, and they can't move up and down like that, now all of a sudden you have a mechanical joint. Now traditionally this kind of peg joinery is done with wood dowels, and they don't really need to be that big. You know a sixteenth inch dowel will solve the purpose because you're going to have multiple of them doing it. But because this was a beginner project, from the get-go I would planned on using screws, and I bought these uh, narrow head screws which are designed for wood and if I recess them a little bit there you can either plug them if you want to do that one I'm just going to leave them right there and that way the shank will slip on this outer one and the threads will somewhat pull it in pull this joint together but that's not really important uh, because we all know that screwing into end grain is kind of a weak joint the most important thing is they will be acting as pegs and the fact that you have them going in opposite directions will give you the strength we want. Now we aren't going very deep with these, just enough to embed the, the head, but it's always best to drill in line with the board you're drilling into. If I were to stand over here, it's hard to tell if I'm in line with this board and that's what you're going down into. And if it was a very deep hole, it'd be very easy for me to accidentally go off one way or the other. But this way, doesn't really matter because I have all that the meat of that board. I just don't want to screw into air, so to speak. And then with the brad point finding the tip, fairly easy to screw in by hand. It's not a very big screw. Like that our first peg is in and it is slightly below surface level so I can still make pretty with my hand plane and not worry about hitting it. And if you want to plug that with a little dowel you can.
And in the end, I will take one of these little pads. I don't even know what grid it is. It's not too coarse. And just kind of scuff everything up. Just kind of even everything out in case you have any track lines or stuff like that. Now, if you are concerned with gaps in your joinery, this would be the time that if you were to take a little bit of that hide glue and just kind of smush it around in there and then kind of work it in with some sandpaper or something you're sacrificial because it's going to get all gummed up, it'll create a slurry and those cracks will fill up. And then you just sand off or plane off the hide glue after it dries. This is just a toolbox for me, so I'm not too concerned about it. So the last thing with the carcass that we want to do is clean up the top. Kind of level out these corners if you need to. And obviously remove those bandsaw marks and our pencil marks and stuff like that. And for most boxes, getting this perfectly flat is kind of important. Especially if you have a lid sitting on top. I will tell you, with this one, it's not that big a deal. We're just kind of doing the cosmetics of it. And to do it, basically, I've once again set up my planing stop on the end, but I also clamped one of those extra boards on the other side. That gives me a corner that I can kind of push into with this case. Then you grab your hand plane and set it to taking a fairly thin cut. And what we're going to do is work our way around these corners to first level them off. Once we get them even, and you see how it's kind of spanning over multiple boards to create that smoothness. Then we can just kind of plane each one of the individual boards according to their grain pattern. So this one I will come over, come around, just like that work your way around your entire box until you're happy. I personally like my edges chamfered, so at this point in time I'll put a pretty heavy shaving on my block plane just to get the work done. Put a nice chamfer all the way around just because I, I think it has a better feel to it and this being pine it will protect the edges a little bit. So now it's time to work on the tops and bottoms and obviously because of the size of this thing we're going to have to glue them up. But luckily, we have already jointed them. Fit's going to be nice and thin. All we really need to do is glue them up. So here's a quick trick. If you don't have a lot of different clamps, or you don't really want to stress too much about it. Check your glue joint line, and we've got a pretty good gap. This board is maybe a half a millimeter warped up right here, but I'm not going to stress about that. So what I'm going to do is take some blue tape, Cinch the two boards together. Just put some down here, pull it tight, cinch it down there. Do that in a few spaces, then run a bead all the way down. Not worrying about stretching it across the boards just to keep it together. At that point, you can flip it over. Grab your glue, lift it up a little bit. Uh, new glue bottle I'm trying to figure out. And then just squeeze a little in here. Now, this is not going to be a very stressed joint. So I wouldn't worry about, you know, uh, getting it dead perfect. Just a little bit in there will be just fine. Set it down. Wipe off the excess. And then repeat the process with blue tape. Now that is going to tack up pretty quickly. And I have no problem working with that kind of board in about a half hour. But for that half hour, you want it to sit fairly flat. I just like to put them down on the ground. Then do the same exact thing for the other side. So you're going to have a top 
and bottom blank that we will fit in a second. Now both the top and bottom board in my design and kind of this classic style of toolbox, they're actually in set, both of them. So we're now going to have to cut this out and fit it to the box. We're going to fit it in case your box is not quite perfectly square. But the thing comes down to, do you want the seam running down the middle? And I personally kind of like that idea. So the simple thing to do is to take your board, grab a ruler. This is 12 and a half inches in my design. So half of 12 and a half is six and a quarter. So come over, mark that. And I now need to remove this much of this side. If you don't want the seam in the center, just mark it off whatever, however much you want to cut off. So now that you've got that done, for whatever side it's going, whether it's the top or the bottom, make sure you orient them the same because I'm sure you want to put the better looking one on top. Flip it over and line the, the edge you just cut with one side of your box. Then just take a pencil and mark out the shape. This will take into consideration any twist or any other errors you accidentally created. And from there, I would use a common tactic for me is I will bandsaw right up to the line. I'm going to leave the line just as I would with a hand tool and then I'm going to plane back to it. This is going to be really, really tight. Right there. And if you notice, this board is going in the same direction as this board. So the movement between these two should be exactly the same. But this board is going opposite this board. And this board is going to want to expand and contract. So theoretically, it might be a smart idea to have a little bit of a looseness on these two sides right here if you were putting this in in winter. In my location it is already a hundred degrees and this is a really humid version so this board is only going to shrink so I'm fitting it very very tightly in my version simply because I know it's not going to be that big a deal. Now there are a lot of different ways we can attach the bottom but I kind of like the idea of having a removable bottom. So if you ever want to repurpose this toolbox or you come up with an entirely new set of toolbox and you've had everything custom fitted, but then you can just remove it, put a new bottom in, and there you go. So instead of gluing it in or rabbiting it in or pocket holding it in, we're gonna peg it. And since we peg these corners, it's kind of a theme. So the first thing I need to do is just like I did here, I want to come up half the distance of this bottom board up here and just create that recess for the screws to fit a little bit below the surface so it will look just like this. And because, once again, I like the proportions, and yet, but I hate doing math, well, if I take the distance of two of these, that will give me a two to one ratio of the pegs on the bottom. I kind of like that idea. So 
So I will find the center. And be sure to check it from both directions just in case your ruler is a little bit off. This one's pretty good. And that'll be my first divot and then just walk it off. And in order to get the spacing up right from the bottom right, I'm I did a, this right here, but I'm not going to run a line because I don't want that line to show up. So what I would do is I will kind of use them both at the same time. So at each step, I just put this over here, bump it up against that, and that creates the perfect spacing for me. And screwing that in couldn't have been easier. Just, you know, drill a hole, put the port board down, and Press it down while you screw it and you'll be okay. And if you forgot to do the make it pretty on the bottom before you installed it, no stress. Just grab your card scraper, pop it up against a planning stop. And a little glue squeeze out, leveling out the base. All easy. for stopping the video here but it just seemed a natural break because in the next step we begin working at the top now I just do want you to pause and think about what you've accomplished if you've gone this far you have basically made a very solid carcass different dimensions and you have a wall cabinet put a door on it put a window in that door a very elegant display cabinet you put it on its side, attach some legs, maybe put some drawers in there. You now have a uh, dresser. Make it a little bigger, put a different kind of top than what we will be doing, and you have a nice blanket chest with kind of a green and grain or Asian theme to it. And this is only the really first build of fine woodworking we've done because the very first thing you did was built the workbench, and that was kind of crude carpentry. You took this entire project to develop the skills that you will be doing, using for the rest of your woodworking career. And I almost guarantee that if at, you, at this point you decided to stop and build a second one, that second one is going to be perfect because you had so much time to refine your mistakes going through the long process we did with this one. But anyways, on the next video, we will build the top. Now as you leave here, I do want you to remember that content creators like me really do work on kind of a value for value proposition. Kind of like a street performer. We do our little song and dance and then we'll put the little tip hat out. You get to receive the benefit first and put a value on it yourself. So if you see the benefit of a longer series just like this that you can use or that future generations could use, Maybe look down in the description to see different ways you can patronize us to help subsidize all this effort. Even if it is just sharing the channel with others. And as we wrap it up, as always, I want you to remember that it's worth the effort to learn. It's worth the effort to create stuff. And it's worth the effort to just pass it on to other people to share it. Y'all be safe and have fun.